Glory to Jesus. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. What a joy. What a joy. Pastor Olumide and Pastor Emisi. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you once again for just allowing me to continue to do life and ministry with you both and, and your ministries and just to again have the privilege to be part of the Fountain of Life Hope Center Church. Uh, it's a thrill. It's a thrill. And I, I don't take this lightly. And just to be part of this recalibrate uh, retreat for the entire church team, it's just a joy. So thank you for having me. You you both know I love you guys dearly, deeply, and eternally. P.O., the bishop of the house and the matriarch of the house, uh, P.I. of life. Thank you guys so much. What an amazing work you all are doing with the team, the amazing team that you are all surrounded with is is a blessing it's a blessing and i love you guys i love you guys dearly thank you for allowing me to share this moment praise god so i want to jump straight into um uh, what i've prepared i bring greetings from my sweetheart uh, pastor busola doing and one of our favorite scripture being an identity coach is ephesians 1 13. it says it is in him we find out who we are and what we are living for and that's going to be what I want to really tie into. And really, that scripture talks about our uh, our new creation, who we now are. And now that ties to serving God, being and doing all that God wants us to be. Doing precedes being. Once we begin to understand who we are now in Christ, then we begin to discover that we are called for a specific assignment in the kingdom of God. There are two main uh, focus that um, I want to address, which is uh, your, you, your new creation reality and your new covenant reality. Just understanding those two concepts because they're interwoven. That's what Ephesians 1, 13 says or 11. It says it is in him you, you find out who you are and is in him you discover what you are called to do. Okay, so that is very crucial. And uh, so I'm going to be looking at those two concepts because uh, your new creation realities is what offers you the understanding, the in-depth understanding and revelation of who you are in Christ. And then, of course, that now ties to you know what you are called to do and how God is called us to do this. And I think as as workers, as as ministers, as laborers in the kingdom, it is very necessary that we remind ourselves. Of this foundational truth it's fundamental to everything that the kingdom holds for you and I so as we continue to seek a deeper um, relationship with God and you know what and a more effective work for God these are very uh, important subjects that we need to continue to explore and we cannot exhaust the revelation and the strength of this revelation in us, in the world, navigating who we are in Christ and what we are called to do. Let me just go to the scriptures. I want to make sure that that's that scripture I'm referring to. You have the right scripture for it. The message translation of Ephesians 1.11. Ephesians 1.11. And this is what it says. It said, it is in Christ that we find out who we are and what we are living for. It is in Christ we find out who we are and what we are living for. Yes. So you see, this talks about, you know what, our identity and it talks about our purpose, talks about our assignment, talks about our ministry. Both is interwoven. For us to have a more effective ministry, we must continually understand and, on, on, and explore uh, who we are because what we are called to do which is the reason so purpose for which we are here because we are in one form of service in this in the church in 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 in, in hope center and 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 that is why we want to see and develop a a sharper cutting edge as a ministry and as 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 a team however for us to achieve that we cannot uh, pursue that or attempt that 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 higher dimension or or greater dimension or more effective dimension of ministry without again addressing the revelation and a deeper knowledge a deeper understanding 
and exploring all the benefits of understanding who we are. And that's what new creation is all about. Everything, like we always say, rise and falls on leadership is the same thing that everything starts and ends with who we are in Christ. And that's one of my wife's favorite uh, saying as an identity coach okay so let us read second corinthians 5 17 we all know second corinthians 5 17 but you see how many of us the question is how many of us as christians are truly really exploring and taking advantage of this revelation of second corinthians 5 17 and this is what he says he says therefore if anyone is in christ he is a new creation all things have passed away Behold, all things have become new. All things have become new. This scripture is one of the foundational scriptures for new creation reality. You as a new creation, it must become a reality. This new creation that we now are, pardon me, in Christ must become beyond, you know what, um, uh, a text. It must become a reality because everything starts and ends with understanding who we now are. Because that is how we can be effective in the kingdom. Most especially if we are called to serve in the kingdom of God. It makes you a number one target for the adversary. Makes us, you are now a target for the enemy. Paul said, a great and effectual door has been opened to me. What door was he talking about? The door and the opportunity for ministry to serve, to advance the kingdom of God. But again, Paul tells us that there is also a great adversary. And if you study the life of Paul as every other uh, uh, character in the Bible, you know what, they had to push through adversary opposition and the enemy is the one behind all of this but you see it now boils down all this this boils down back to hey do they understand who they were in in their time because that is the that is what gives them the capacity for them to continue to forge ahead and to continue to advance the kingdom of god and that is what we are called to do and for us you and i um we are not an exception to to dealing with an adversary, having to, you know, or contend for the faith. That's what the Bible says. It says we should contend for the faith. Another scripture says, fight the good fight of faith. Why? To lay hold on what? On eternal life. What life is he talking about? This new life that we have now in Christ. It's talking about the new creation life that we have. So that must become a revelation to us. And why in particular? And I want to narrow, you know, what the purpose of this teaching to ministry. Because you're going to see, like we read in Ephesians 1.11, that what we are living for, which is what we are called to do, which is what we are doing, that many of us are beginning to explore, you know, what our calling, our assignment, our purpose, which is to serve God, which is to serve humanity. This is why you are in this retreat. This is why you are here. Because you're already exploring, you're already exploring this, the purpose for which you are living but it is connected to, first of all, who you are. So the better you know yourself, the more effective your service will be. The better you understand all that is available to you in Christ, the more effective, the more powerful, the more formidable, the more unstoppable you are in the service of the kingdom of God. And this is where a lot of people make the mistake because do you want to disconnect both? You cannot disconnect both. It cannot be disconnected. This is why scripture is very clear on many occasions. The consistency of this truth, you know what, is, 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 is uncompromisable in the word of God. You will see it in the scripture. That who you are is connected to what you're called to do. And how effective you will be, you know what, in, that, in what God has called you to be. And this goes as far back. As the book of Genesis, in the beginning, you can see the first thing God addressed before the assignment of man was his identity, was his new creation, who he now was in Christ, in the Lord. And then we can talk about what God has called him to do. Another scripture I'd like to read, um, that I'd like to read is um, 1 Peter 2.9. Let's look at 1 Peter 2.9. 1 Peter 2.9. 
That's a powerful truth there, and I'm going to be drawing most of my um, concept, you know, of, of this teaching from, from 1 Peter 2, 9. All right? All right, let's look at 1 Peter 2, 9. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Into his marvelous light. What is the light that he's talking about? He's talking about who you are. He's called you into a new identity. That's what John chapter 1 says, that in him was the light, and this light became the life of men, or in him was life, and this light became the light of men. In other words, you know what, the life that Jesus carried became the life of men, which is what he came to give us. Again, he's talking about new creation. So you see, so all of this scripture, there's consistency of, of, of this truth in the scripture. But you see, Peter in this passage points out to us as his readers the identity of a believer for a specific reason. And I will show you the reason. It tells us who we are in Christ through redemption for an important, important, important reason. Let's go back to it again. We all know this scripture. But I just want to point your line to a fine line in this text, okay? It says, but you are a chosen generation. It's addressing now who we are. When you give your life to Christ, when you, uh, when you receive salvation, he says, you are in what? A chosen generation. It's talking about identity. A royal priesthood, identity. A holy nation, identity. His own special people, identity. Then it switches here. That you may proclaim. That you may proclaim. This is the reason for which Peter told us or is telling us, first of all, who we are, our new nature for a purpose. Why? Because in who we are is where we find what we can do and what we are called to do and how we can effectively do it. All right? This is very important because the foundation of every minister's accomplishment or fulfillment in ministry lies in their true identity. You need to know your uniqueness as a leader, your uniqueness as a, as a servant in the house of God because that's why Paul talks about the diversity of gifts but the same spirit. And unfortunately, we do not embrace this in its totality. And this is the reason why, this is the reason we have found ourselves within the church competing with one another. This is the reason why we have found ourselves envying one another. Jealousy of one another's gifts. Why? Because we do not understand that in its, in its functionality, we are different. But in its essence, we are the same. It's a diversity of gifts, diversity of operation, but the same spirit. And who, we, who are we? S spirit. We are a spirit living in the body and we have a soul. That's what it is. We are spirit. So at that level, we are all the same. But the functionality because of our earthly assignment is different. And because the way God has structured his body in terms of if you look at the human anatomy, there's different parts of the body. But it's on one body. My hand right now is not on, Pastor, on Bishop's hand, on Bishop's body. No, my hand is on this same body. So my fingers are not equal. They are not the same. But they are still on my body. They are all part of my body. We are one together. Every features in this body, we are one together. So this is why I'm saying if we are going to see effective ministry we must understand this because that is the only way we can maintain one of the most important vital force for advancing the kingdom of God and it's the force of unity. It's the force of unity. It will be difficult for us to achieve unity, to make a church very strong and unstoppable if we do not play to the advantage of our identity in Christ. Because in that we find our strength. So look at what Peter talks about here. Look at the descriptions that what he has used to qualify all those of us who are in Christ. He didn't use one description. He says, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a special people. What I see here is like you are saying, you are a finger. 
You are an elbow. You are a shoulder. You are an ear. You are a mouth. You are a eyes. You are a feet. You are a knee. You are an ankle. You are a shoulder blade. It's just using all of these differences, but yet in Christ, we are one. We understand who you are. You know who you are. And therefore, that reveals to you what you are called to do and how you can effectively do it. A fish would effectively swim if a fish does not try to be a bird. And a bird would effectively fly if that bird doesn't try to be a caterpillar. So you see functionality in ministry, effectiveness in kingdom service boils down to accepting your uniqueness, accepting your makeup, accepting how God has wired you and designed you. Because this is what Peter is saying. Your ability to proclaim to proclaim is dependent and functional on your understanding of who you are, of your makeup, of your design, of your structure. That way we can both now begin to move towards what we call synergy. And synergy I see as a compound word. Two words becoming one word. The first word is sync. S-R-S-Y-N-C. Sync. And the other is energy. As long as we don't find a way to sink our energy, it will become destructive. Not only will it become destructive, it will be obstructive for kingdom advancement, for church growth, for church impact, for church relevance. Why? Because a house that is divided cannot stand. And that is why the enemy plays his best game at disuniting us from within from within that's why even jesus said it is not what um comes this was it is not what comes into you from the outward that defiles a man it is what comes out of you so this is why satan's strategy has always been divide and conquer so that's what he did he divided look at in the beginning in the beginning, in Genesis 1, 26 to 28, when God, you know what, gave man his assignment, God, first of all, defined who the man is, helped him to understand his identity. You are created in me after my likeness. Because of this, 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 because of your nature, your ability comes from your nature. Your assignment is derived from your nature. So you need to first understand who you are before you get about what you are called to do. So even as a church, who are we as a church? A team must have an identity, must have a culture that unites all of you together, a, a, a singular value system that no matter what language you speak or what tribe you are from, whether you are from, you are Igbo, you are Awusa, you are Efik, you are uh, Yoruba, it doesn't matter, you are Igbo, it doesn't matter. What unites us is to unite around a core value that reflects the nature of God that we all now carry. This is why we are told in the epistles, that there's, where there's no longer Jew or Greek in Christ. We are now one. So we must find what are the core center principles and values and morals of our Lord Jesus Christ and unite ourselves around that such that what we are, who we are, is not different because of our, our, our ethnic differences or varieties. It doesn't matter. What matters is that we have found what who we are. We've discovered who we are now in Christ Jesus. So this is why in the battle for destiny, the greatest defeat of mankind is, the, is, what, is that of false identity. And this is what I'm talking about. Satan's strategy is divide and conquer. And that is why I am so glad, Pastor Olumide and Pastor Emisi, that you have continued to, you know what, bring your, your, your team together. Because this is a time for us to not only be equipped and empowered, but also a time to fellowship, to bond. That's what family do. 
my, my family, we only all of us have, we are living, we, our identity is the same. My son, my daughters, you know what, my wife, we are maybe different in nature, in, 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 um, in functionality. But in nature, we are the same. It's the same blood that is flowing through us. It's the same DNA that is flowing through us. But what did the enemy do? Divide and conquer. Because my question up until today is, where was Adam when all that lengthy conversation was going on? But he was smart. He waited for them not to be together and then spoke into one's ear. And that's what he does in the church. He whispers into somebody's ear. He whispers. And because we are not able to talk it out, we are not able to check with each other, we begin to believe the lie of the enemy speaking to us individually. And then once it divides us, it conquers us. It conquers us. And the first ever defeat for the battle of destiny was based on false identity. What did the enemy say to Eve? Do you know if you eat of these fruits, you are going to be like God? But yet in Genesis 1, 26 to 28, God said, let us create man in our own image. And after our likeness, and God created man in his image and after his likeness. So Eve was already God, was already God. She didn't need to be like what she was already but of course, that's the strategy of the enemy to introduce false concept of who you are. And so it's on false identity. This is the reason why man creation fell. And it's still the same battle today. This is why a lot of churches have a lot of churches and ministry are not are not impactful as they should be. Why? Because of mistaken identity. Listen to me, not only do you and I as children of God need to come into a revelation of who we are in Christ, but even as a ministry, we must understand the unique identity of our ministry, which means when we come into that revelation, we know what we are called to do and what we are not called to do. So therefore, you wouldn't come into a church and expect your church to be like one church you saw online or down the block. You will embrace the uniqueness of your church that we are not called to be everybody. Maybe my church is called to be the finger, the right, the left thumb. Maybe that other church is called to be, you know what, the right thumb. And each of them have their effectiveness when they what, operate as, you know what, as our God has created us to be in our uniqueness. And that way it will, what, it will tear down the line of the vision. Because that way we can become better collaborate. Today I hear this word thrown around all the time. Collaboration, collaboration. But when I really look at what, what, what we are calling collaboration, it's just, you know what, it's just tolerating one another. In disguise, it's tolerating one another. There is no real synergy. And that is why the energy is not forceful enough to move the kingdom forward. Why? Because it's still clashing. It's still colliding. It has not come to a place to sink. When it sinks, it becomes synergy. And that is positive energy that creates positive outcomes. But everything, if you trace it, you trace it back to not knowing who we are. Not knowing who we are. Not knowing who we are. So it's so powerful when a believer or a minister discovers and operates in his or her true identity because therein lies the fulfillment of his or her dominion mandate. And hey, that is the mandate of the church. My friends, that is the mandate of the church. Dominion is the mandate of the church. That was the mandate given to the first minister of God, the first church. Have dominion on the earth. And we are still, you know, we're in pursuit of the fullness of this dominion mandate. But we cannot arrive at the fullness of dominion if we still are struggling with who we are as a child of God, as ministers, as servants, or even as a church. Even as a church. Because this is crucial. It is crucial in the sense that, number one, your identity and my identity and the identity of your church is what precedes the authority that we can wheel around, that we can operate in as people on the earth. A church without 
governmental authority on the earth is not needed. That church should be closed down. It should be. Because that is what we are here to exercise if we are going to enforce the concepts, the practices, the principles of the kingdom here on earth, then we must have authority to do so. If I stand at a traffic junction wearing normal clothes and having to try attempting to, to stop cars, they will probably run me down. Why? Because I'm a civilian. I don't have the authority to command traffic, to direct traffic. That is why even in our churches, when we have traffic management officials or unit, we give them a uniform that says traffic control. That is why when people are responsible for security in our churches, we put a vest on them saying security. And once people see that vest saying traffic control team, they can direct drivers at their will and those drivers will obey. It's the same thing when it comes to kingdom advancement here on the earth. As far as Satan is concerned, we are illegal in the earth. We are illegal, therefore we have no right of way on the earth. But Jesus, that's why Jesus said, all authority has been given unto me. His mission, first of all, before he could delegate that power, before he could give us the authority, he had to strip it off. This is why the whole redemption package and plan is very crucial to ministry. This is why we cannot over belabor, over emphasize this new creation, you know what, um, understanding and teaching. Because Jesus, all of redemption was to, was to strip the enemy of the authority that was given to him at the fall of man in Genesis based on false identity. We will always exchange our right to represent the kingdom of God here on the earth when we are mistaken of who we are or when we are not operating fully in who we are now. That is why he says, if any man be in Christ, all things have passed away because all things have become new. So we are supposed to be operating from this newness, this newness of life, this newness of life. Can I say this at this junction? Every attempt to advance kingdom will be opposed and that opposition is going to border on the revelation of who you are. I tell you, every opposition, first of all, attacks a man's identity. If you have not realized it, please begin to pay attention. Because this is why many Christians are fighting and losing. Why? Because opposition, you don't realize the first thing every satanic opposition attacks is what is the confidence of who you are in Christ. Of your competence in your field, even in your professional life. And you're, well, you face a challenge, you face an obstacle in your business, you face an obstacle in what you're doing. The first thing is you begin to think of yourself, less of yourself. You begin If you don't remind yourself in that instant of who you are. Recently I preached a message, overcoming pushback. And I really talked about this, you can check it on my YouTube page, Femi Adum. But I was talking about when we, when we, when we encounter any form of pushback, whether in marriage, whether in parenting, whether in ministry, whether in your career, whether in your business, what you don't realize the enemy is after is to discredit you first of all. Once you don't realize that and begin to first fight, begin your battle from reminding yourself of, of who you are, of what God has called you to be, then you can start, you now stand a chance to be able to fight back and overcome it. It's about identity because therein lies your authority and what there is to a church, what there is to a minister who have no authority just because you don't understand that your authority is in who you are. 
you have been authorized. This is why Peter said, because we are all of these things, then we can proclaim. So our ability to proclaim is because we are a royal priesthood. We are a new a holy nation. We are a special people. So because of who we are, we have been given this capacity to do this. So you can do ministry. You can be effective in kingdom service if you are not growing your knowledge and revelation of who you are in Christ and all that it offers you or not. So without a true discovery of our identity, of who we are now in Christ, you and I would have no authority in ministry, in service. Because don't forget that the Bible says we are not resting against flesh and blood. Church, church is not jamboree. I hope you know. Thank God for the celebration that happens in church. And we should celebrate in church. But if that is what it's all about, why do you think the scripture says that the kingdom of God is not in meat and drink? So it's not just about celebration. How, what do you need to celebrate when you go to a celebration event? Meat, drink, food and drink, food and drink. That's what it is in different kinds. Orange juice, grape juice, uh, 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 pineapple juice, and then you have food to eat. But the Bible says the kingdom of God is not about celebration. We're talking about serious warfare here. We're talking about serious work here. And the enemy that we are playing about with is not playing with us. He's not joking with us. This guy is serious about his work 24-7. 24-7. So, so you need to understand that you see everybody, everybody in church must know who they are so that they can operate in the authority that we have in Christ. Kenneth Hagin said this is the least subject that Christians know about. The subject that Christians know the least about. The authority of the believer. And you can never talk about the authority of the believer without talking about the identity of believers. This is why the most powerful, you know, what teaching you would you would you would hear, hear in your entire Christian world is what is new creation reality. For a new convert, new creation reality. For a growing believer, new creation reality. He talks about what does Peter talk about? Peter, when Peter was encouraging you believers to desire the sincere milk of the word of God, what was he talking about? First of all, addressing your identity, and then you know what you need to continue to grow. This is who you are. Look at what Paul also says that you know what, as long as a son, you know what, who is heir to the throne, does not know who he is, he will want, he continues to want, he's still a child, then he continues to be a slave, and the slave will be what master over him. What is he talking about? Identity. A lot of people celebrating in church don't know who they are. So in life, they are what they are slaves when they're supposed to be masters. A child can never inherit anything as long as he's immature. As long as he's immature, forgive me. As long as he's immature, he can never, he can never, he can never do that. As long as he's immature. So you see what we're talking about? So on the day today, we have the church of Jesus Christ. Full of children of God who don't even know who they are. They hear about it, they have a sense of it, but they don't have a personal revelation of it. So when you are talking about, so when we have a church full of people who don't know who they now are in Christ, who don't understand, when you say, I am a child of God, I am born again, I have experienced salvation, I am redeemed of the Lord. Ah, you don't know what that means. You don't know what that means. Ha! Ah, everything rises, starts, and ends with redemption. You, 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 you don't even understand the capacity that lies inside of you. This is very crucial. Look, so it's crucial. Look at what Luke 10, 18 to 20 says. Luke 10, 18 to 20. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpent and scorpions and, all, and over all the power of the enemy. All the power of the enemy. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirit are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. See the connection of who you are. 
How do you know who somebody is if not by name? Name is a means of identification. Identification. So you know somebody, oh, you introduce, oh, that's, that's Pastor Emisi. Okay, I, I know. So it's a means of identification. But look at what he's saying. All the powers of the enemy. It didn't say some. I'm telling you. This is why I tell you that a day old child in Christ is more powerful than the ageless devil. <laughs> Let me say that again. A day old child in Christ with this revelation is more powerful than the ageless devil. A day old child. Why do you think Satan wanted to kill Jesus as a baby? Why do you think Satan wanted to kill Moses as a baby? Because he knows who they are. And because he knows who they are, he knows the power and the authority that they will exercise against him. Once they come into the fullness of that revelation and that understanding of who they were. When Moses did not know who he was, he was running. He was running. He was running. Ministry could not advance in his hands. Ministry could not prosper in his hands. You know, when, 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 when I came to the Lord, there's sorry, some of you I know, I'm, I'm going about, you know, and, and there's just some, some songs that for me uh, 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 makes a lot of meaning to me. And I remember I used to sing this song, and I would say, Lord, want me on, and I'll be crying to the Lord, and I'll be praying, said, I said, and I'll put my own medley, Lord, want me, Kole Baje, oh, Laye me, Kole Daru, oh, Ishe, oh, Lua, Kole Baje, oh, Lord, want me. And you know, I would pray this song in my early days when I came to the Lord and I came to a, 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 an understanding of my calling in Christ, and I would cry and say, Lord, the work of God can never, 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 never be destroyed in my hands. And I realized that I needed to grow up. That can only be possible when you know who you are in Christ. Otherwise, the enemy will mess everything that you are doing up. Moses could not undo kingdom until he knew who he was. That's why God subjected him to 40 years of what self-discovery. Some of you, what you are dealing with right now is not the enemy. It's what is a journey of self-discovery. Until God knows that you know who you are, you can't undo the things of the kingdom. That's why, why did you think the Bible says that Jesus, what word would read where it was written concerning him? That guy, first of all, before he what lent ministry, he lent himself. Bible says in Hebrews 8, he came in the volumes of the books of what was written about him. In the volumes of the book. He was learning himself before he was even attempted ministry. Many of you, you are doing ministry without even knowing, having a clue about who you are. About who you are. And then you expect that service, kingdom service, ministry will be effective in your hands. It's impossible. It is in Christ. We know who we are and find what we are called to do. Those, you cannot separate that. Okay? So without discovering your kingdom identity, your ministry identity, your service identity, your, who you are, you are, you are unauthorized. You are unauthorized to walk in the supernatural, which means you forfeit dominion on the earth. You can't walk in the supernatural. And what is there to church without supernatural? I mean, thank God that, you know, both of your leaders, you know, there are people giving into training and equipping people to bring the kingdom of God down into the earth, to bring heaven here on earth, to walk in the supernatural. That's why you have all the Revival Academy, you have all of these things going on. Even in the church there, you have, you know, a, a very robust, you know, what program to help you understand these things. But it is very crucial that you understand who you are. Let me say something. Being a soldier for Christ or a servant of God does not give you dominion. It's being a son or a daughter of God that does. Because as a soldier, you are under command. As a servant, you are under instruction. But as a son, you are in command and you instruct. So you see, it boils down to who you are in Christ. Oh my God. We already spent 44 minutes already. Ah, Bishop P.I., how are we going to do this? Okay, <laughs> let me see how much ground I can cover. Okay, so thank you, Jesus. 
Exactly. You see that again in 1 Samuel 17, 18, 8 to 9, when, when Goliath stood before David and he called the army, said, oh, the army of Saul. That's why they were scared. That's why they couldn't exercise the authority. But look at what David said. David said, no, how, what he said, you uncircumcised Philistine, how dare you threaten the army of the living God, the army of God. What did he do? Change the identity. So Goliath was able to suppress them, overpower them by giving them the wrong identity. That's what the enemy does to strip us of authority. So when we are in ministry, we are just gathering celebration. But where is dominion? Where are we dominating? Where are we, in, you know what, bringing transformation, enforcing the will of God, enforcing what God wants to be done in a region, in a place, in a nation. Why? It takes authority to do that. I can't enforce any kind of law if I don't have authority. And here on earth, the only authority that we need to enforce the kingdom of God here on earth is the authority that Jesus gave to us. Even him didn't send us without authority. Okay? All right, let me skip quite a number of things so I can just, you know, keep this under an hour. Okay? Second thing. So, your identity precedes your authority. Secondly, your ability. Your ability is revealed in your what? In your identity. What you and I can do is in who we are. And that's, what, that, and that's why most times, natural or physical inability is a function of lack of spiritual identity. What you can do. And that is what ministry is all about. Ministry is not talk. Ministry is work. And a lot of times, we feel incompetent. Especially when our leaders are, 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 are demanding a higher level, a higher standard, a higher level of excellence, a higher level of ministry. And you're thinking, can I, can, I, can I go thus far? No. Isaiah 45 talks about you stretching. So if we are going to see increase, if we are going to see advancement, we need to be prepared to be stretched. But you have the ability. I'm telling you, listen, listen, you mothers, you know what, and mothers to be, I, I'm telling you, you have, my, you have my respect for life. I haven't been to labor ward and delivery with my wife three times. And sometimes I wonder, you know what, the capacity of a woman, the ability of a woman to bring forth a child Ah, you know what I'm talking. I don't want to go go graphic on you guys, but that that sometimes you don't know, and sometimes you are looking like you mean a whole child is going to come out of. I'm telling you, sorry that I'm being, but that is the honest truth. Sorry, that's the only <laughs> illustration that comes to mind. But what am I telling you is the fact that you don't know how much capacity that is in you and I. But you see, when a woman does not accept I'm a woman, she would never have that capacity, believe she has that capacity, because she doesn't know the anatomy that God has created a woman with, that listen, when the time for labor comes, a child will come out from that place. So, so, so once she starts thinking, not as a woman, then she's going to say, I can't do it. I mean, because why a man does not have that capacity? As long as she's not thinking that she's a man, you know what? She would what she would have the capacity. The ability to do it is in who she is, woman. That's why it's called woman. A woman with a womb. A man with a womb. So it's a, the ability to bring forth an entire life from what from 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 from, from, from that canal place is because she has been designed with that capacity. So everything we will do in ministry is based on that revelation of this is what I'm called to do. This is why I love being me, because you see what makes me a genius is because I've embraced who I am. I'm not going to be like P.I. I celebrate P.I. I celebrate Pastor Lumi. There are things that they do that I cannot do. And I look at it. And that's why I'm glad we're in covenant. We're in partnership. Why? Because when I'm around them, I'm equally, I'm blessed by what they have capacity to do. When they're around me, they are blessed with what I have the capacity to do. So I love being me. I light up. I light up when I embrace ego. I light up. That's the way it is. You know, and we will never pioneer anything. The ability to start something new, the ability to dig new wells is in you embracing who you are for many years. You know what, especially in our region right there, we never thought, you know what, that people could make a difference without having, you know what, a large church. 
And many young evangelists, many called, called, true called apostles that God wanted to use to break grounds in the nation, wanted to use to do things, pioneer things. Uh, many of them became trapped in the identity of a pastor. You know what? And I can speak for Nigeria because I grew up there and I started ministry there. I learned ministry there. And many, many, including myself in the early days, were just trapped in the mentality that I got to have a church. I got to pastor a church. I got to have a mega church for me to have a voice, for me to make a difference, for me to advance the kingdom of God. And I struggled with this. I remember in my early days, God began to tell me, now I've called you as an apostle. Meanwhile, that was the first thing the Lord spoke to me by revelation when I came to the Lord in the year I came to the Lord. Next year, February, it'll be 20 years I've been in ministry in kingdom service. And the Lord spoke to me from day one. I knew I was called as an apostle to the nations. Even though I knew this, but I was caught up in an environment that, you know what, ministry expression has to be in one way. So when the time came years down the line that God was saying, it's time for you to step in into this calling because your ability to make a difference in the kingdom is tied to who you are. It became a struggle and I would sit on planes going on, on international mission trips. And I would feel so guilty. Why? Because the enemy will speak. And says, this is not who you are. You speak to nations. You speak to pastors. How many members do you have in your church that you want to go and be speaking to nations? It's not people like you that speak to the nation. And people will not realize when you see that, that, that post, the eagle is about to take off. Sometimes I'm in what, hours of flight just battling, battling. Feeling like an hypocrite, feeling like I'm false, feeling like I'm a fraud star because the enemy was speaking. And I will try when I go out there and God will use me so much powerfully and pastors of churches will come around me. I'm very quick to tell them, oh, you know, we just pastor a small church in London. They didn't ask me a question. Nobody asked me about church. But for me, I just felt like, you know what, for you to be able to do this, it must be equated that you have a size of church in this capacity so before they even ask me anything and they wouldn't even ask me these are people who are just seeing the grace of god and they embrace like wow you know what this is what we need but me my head because of that construct that that uh, um, uh, social uh, co- uh, construct i would quickly be running my mouth oh no we just passed a small church in london da, 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 da. and god will say shut your mouth you are not a pastor that was wilderness that was equipping I needed to put you in a place where I can work on you and release you as my apostle to the nation. He said, how many campuses did you do in Nigeria? Over 25 campuses that I traveled over Nigeria and planted this that campus fellowship. You know what? So so you already worked in that calling, but now to the nations, you know what? I needed to what? To withdraw you and hide you and work on you and release you. It wasn't based on church. I didn't ask you to build me a church. I asked you to start a church so I can build you. So I can build you. What, what makes you think, you know what, it's about building a mega church? You know, if I wanted you to do that, you would do that easily because I'll give you the ability. But I ask you to do this so that I can have a place to equip you, to build you up, and then release you to your next level of assignment. And I remember I went to my pastor, Pastor Sam. I was still fighting, dealing with this. And I went to my pastor and I said, Dad, I said, I'm having a struggle. He said, what? I said, well, every time I get on that plane, I said, I, I get fulfilled with what God does. But I'm still having a struggle within, you know, what the church and the nations because I just feel that the church must, must be like a qualifi- qualifier for the nations. And my pastor said to me, never forget, this is what rescued me, you know, what and saved me from this, this demonic pressure. And he said, son, he said, don't worry about it. He said, put one leg in the church and put one leg in the nations. He said, very soon you will know where both both legs need to fit in. And that advice saved me. So I I stayed diligent to the church and I stayed faithful to the missions. And it didn't take time. The whole world knew that yes, it was called to the nation. And I didn't feel any guilt. And when the time came, I gave God back his training school. Because for me, the church was a training school. I said, Lord, thank you. This is the training school. And he said, fly. And we're still flying. What am I saying? Your ability as a servant in the house, as a minister in the house, as a leader in the house, as a pastor in the house, as an evangelist in the house, find your identity. You will find your ability. My wife finds the ability so easy to evangelize because she's an evangelist by call. She's an evangelist. So for her, she will always win soul. It's easy. It's an anointing. You know, it doesn't matter where you are, how you look. She will talk about Jesus Christ. She will get you to that place where you will consider Christ. 
Why? Because she's an evangelist. That's why our message is one, identity in Christ. That's what evangelists do. To bring us into that knowledge of Christ. So that we can begin to live the fullness of who we are in Christ. That is the message of an evangelist. That's what they are called to do. So we need to, as she's not struggling, by the grace of God next year, when I say, well, we celebrate 20 years in ministry, I'm saying, we're also going to be doing our ordination service to be ordained as an evangelist into the body of Christ. And she can do that in our own creative ways. You see what we're talking about? And that was a struggle because everybody wanted to fit in into a ministry mode. But that's not what God does. All right? It is not what you do that determines or defines who you are. But it is who you are that influences your outcome. That influences your outcome. And this is the reason why the 10 spies out of the 12 that were sent to carry out ministry in the land of promise, they could not, they thought they could not do carry that mission out. Why? Because of how they saw themselves. Because of how they saw themselves. Don't look at, let me tell you something, there are so many powerful people in Hope Center. Don't look at anybody and think, ah, me, I can't do that. You look at Bishop, ah, man, Bishop, when Bishop can switch from, from worship, you know what, to preaching, to teaching, to being, an, to, you know, he, and you look at that and say, ah, man, my pastor is just too much. Thank God your pastors are too much. You look at P.I., like, ah, thank God. Do you know that if you step into who you are and discover what you are called to do, your pastors will also look at you and say, Twale, ha! That's the whole idea. That's the way I look at your pastor. I look at them and I'm like, God, you are so good. My God. Why? Because they are operating in their uniqueness. And let me tell you something. Mutual, listen to this, mutual submission is the key to collective dominion. Mutual submission is the key to collective dominion. If a church is going to operate in this fullness of power, authority, and dominion, we must have mutual submission in place. And what does that mean? It means I submit to you. You submit to you. And that can only happen when you recognize the strength of another person and you recognize your own weakness. And then he, the other person also does that vice versa. We submit. That's why the Bible says submit to one another. Submit to one another. And the problem is that we're always focused on another man's gift that we don't even appreciate ours. I, I, I just don't know why the, the brothers of Joseph did not pay attention to very vital information of the dream Joseph dreamed. But you see, because of something in them, they didn't even get the message. Because the guy did not say, I saw all of you bowing down to one star. He said, I saw all of us as stars. And those stars in this assignment were bowing to this star. But in the dream, all of them were stars. All of them were stars. So why did they try to kill the guy? But you see, when you don't appreciate things, uh, you know, come to this understanding, you don't, you forget that even you, you are, you have your own unique ability, and then you'll be looking for a way to suppress the other person. In the dream, they were all stars. These were the tribes of Israel. They were all stars. But the guy is saying, in my own assignment, I shone brighter. So maybe if you find your own assignment, you will shine brighter. And we will have what mutual submission to one another. All of the blessing pronounced on all 12 tribes of Israel were different. And it all gave them different capacity. Go and read First Chronicles when the Bible was talking about the sons of Issachar. All of the, it wasn't just the only tribe that was mentioned. All other tribe had their own unique assignment and skills and expertise in Israel. But the only reason why we talk about the sons of Issachar is because of their own unique calling, which is based on the ability to understand times and season. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Okay. All right. Let me move quickly. <sighs> Hallelujah. Mako robo shekerebe kisa. Manga da 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 balado seka parada susta. All right. Community. Community. Identity is also what defines community. Who you are now in Christ. This new creation reality is what defines your tribe. 
when you find who you are, your uniqueness. Based on your uniqueness, you begin to what discover and the what your tribe, your community. So your identity defines your community. That's what we're talking about. It is very crucial. One of the things that make you unique and will also help you in fully maximizing your call to ministry is your habitation, your habitat. Where are you? Who, who, who are you doing ministry with? Who are you doing ministry with? This is very crucial. This is very crucial. Who are you doing ministry with? Who are you calling your own? Who is referring to you as his own? That's why the Bible says we can't be unequally yoked. And it's not just talking about unbelievers and believers. It also applies to believers. Yes, we are all one, but we have been called uniquely. That's why God, you know what, divided the Israel into 12 tribes. And uniquely gifted those tribes. And those tribes is what defines their identity. When you see the tribe of Manasseh to Dan, you can tell. It's just like in Nigeria. Nigeria is a country with over 375, you know, what unique tribes. But we are one nation. If we are able to find our unity, we are all Nigerians. Anyway, they will not say, oh, when on your passport, they would not say, uh, what is your tribe? It says nationality, Nigerian. It doesn't say ethnicity. Maybe other forms will give you further breakdown. Okay, Nigeria, ethnicity, maybe it's birth certificate. Okay, uh, Igbo, uh, Edo, and all that. But on your main passport, it's a Nigerian passport. That's your nationality. British nationality. On your birth certificate, you can now say, okay, what city are you born in? Okay, I'm born in Lytonstone. I'm born in Walthamstow. I'm born in Stratford City. I'm born in this borough. It doesn't matter. But what it is ultimately is that your nationality. Your nationality. And we, we do not define our, our tribe by nationality or skin color. It's by, it's, by, it's by our covenant. It's by our covenant. It's by understanding our unique identity that, listen, yeah, deep call it unto deep. Deep call it unto deep. This is the reason why John and Jesus worked together. This is why John didn't have a problem to be introduced as he was not the light. He said there was a man sent by God, John chapter 1. He was not the light, but he was sent to be a witness of the light. So you and I need to know what we are not. Not only is it important to know who you are, but it's also crucial to know who you are not. And be comfortable about it. And join with the other person. That knows that is that is different from you, which is very crucial. This is the only way we can work together in unity and harmony in church. It's very crucial. The team, the workforce, the leadership. We are we are we are strong together. He says it is where God commands His blessing in the place of unity. And so it, there's nothing you must don't don't fight order. When God talks about commanding the blessing on unity. But it also gives us the diversity of what becomes our unification. It talks about the head, the beard, and the garment. It's different. The head is different from the beard. The beard is different from the garment. So it's talking about leadership, eldership, membership. Everybody must operate. That's what Joel talked about, matching information without breaking ranks. When you are supposed to be an elder and you are what and you are you are you are you are you are you are you want to you want to you are envying you know what being a leader and then you know what you don't know your place yet that you are you know what in membership this this growth process we all are baptized into the body we are all coming in as members in the membership and as we continue to grow continue to serve then we will move up toward to eldership and we continue to grow and continue to build and recognize that and then by god's grace it elevates us toward to leadership but you can't skip all of those processes this is where the problem is this is very crucial so your company matters look at matthew 17 1 Three, 
It says, now after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brothers, led them up on high mountains by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to him, talking with him. Talking with him. You see those, those see the community of people he is in? And these were people from different generations, different assignments. But you know what? They had a purpose together in God. And each of it was connected to the ultimate plan of God. Ultimate plan of God. So, so this was not based on because they were born in the same time or in the same era. You know, or, or, or they were peers or age mates. No. But it's telling you the purpose of what, the power of what, of community. When you understand who you are, we are all serving the Lord. We all had an assignment in the Lord. We all had a purpose. That's why the Bible is saying, look at what he said. Elijah had, uh, had been far dead. But yet the Bible says concerning John the Baptist that he was going to be strength, sent in the strength of Elijah. So you see, it's about covenant community based on our identity. Sent in the strength of Elijah. Okay, so your company matters. Acts 15 22. Then it pleased the apostles and elders with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, who was also named Basabas, and Silas, leading men among the, the brethren of their own company. How do you choose your company? Your identity. So when you meet each other, you can tell. It's like when P.I. and I met back in those days. We just knew the different. We didn't see any different. I didn't see her different from me. Neither she did see. There was nothing. I was in the U.K. She was in Nigeria. We did not see any different. We just saw when we met. We knew that just, just this is my own. This is my own. So it didn't matter. Nothing else mattered. Until today, nothing else still matters. And thank God, you know what, when, you know what, now she's married to, uh, to Bishop. When we met to the same thing. One of the most secure husbands I've met in my life. Salute to you, P.O. And that's why we're still doing life. We're still growing stronger. And in this family, in this friendship, we don't break ranks. We still, we understand that. But you see, it's more of, you know what, us, you know what, that this is my own. When you are, in the, when you are amongst your own, you are not, you are not, you are not fussy. You are not, you are not worrying about, oh, are you going to be this one? Are you going to be this? We, we, see, we, we, we celebrate each other. That's what it's all about. So you don't choose your company based on your racial identity, but on your kingdom identity. And that's why this church that you are in is your community. If it is not, please, and I can say this because I know your pastors, if, this is, if you've not found this place as your community, ask them to pray for you to help you locate it because you will better thrive. That's what it's all about. You better thrive. Well, no, this is not about filling up a church. No. The Bible, Jesus said, he said he knew he was sent to the lost sheep of Israel, lost house of Israel. Jesus did not try to minister to anybody. That's why in Luke, when the John 12, 24, when they came to him and said, you know what, some of the uh, guys, the Greek guys, have come to see him, the Gentiles. They immediately he said, except a corn of wheat falls down into the ground and die, he abides alone, but if he does, he bears more. What do you think he was talking about? It almost seems that there's no connection with, okay, uh, you have guests too, and then immediately you looked at them and said, except the corn. He was talking about himself. I have to die and reproduce myself so that others can take on this ministry. This is the reason why he had to go after Paul so that he can reach out to these Gentiles. Jesus knew that, listen, this is not my assignment on the earth. But you see, I will raise an army that is going to do that. My ministry is to Jews. So Paul had to go. That's why he appeared to Paul in Acts 9 and raised up Paul who could effectively minister to the Jews. One time that Peter ministered to the Jews, there was commotion back in, in, in Jerusalem. Oh, you mean, oh, how did these people get baptized? He said, me too, I don't know, I was just speaking to them. The Holy Spirit bypassed me. Why? Because of bias, unconscious bias in the heart of Peter. That's why God could not use them for the Gentile church. In Antioch, they left in Jerusalem. They left, they left them in there. So they were, and that's why they said, when they perceived the grace of God, they gave me a right hand of fellowship and said, you go and minister to the Gentiles. So what are we, and that was what Jesus was referring to in John. Listen, if I don't leave this place, these people will be deprived of ministry because I am not the one that is meant to minister to them. So you see what you see that understanding of knowing who we are, 
is going to solve all of this problem. And then you can be focused in your local assembly and build there and not look out there and look out there and look at it. Listen, when I was in Nigeria and I was serving in Daystar, I celebrated every church. Her pastor is very, you know, my pastors are very large hearted and all of that. So we are not the kind of church that is not, you know, does not embrace. But listen, I knew I found my tribe. If you ask me how many events did I go to in my years of service in this time, I cannot remember one. Because I was so given into my job. There was too much work. In, what am I looking for? So even when these guest ministers come and say, at least we can, but I wasn't jumping from one place, looking at this church, this one and that church, and looking at that pastor. We celebrate everybody. They always come over to the church, but we were too busy just building, just building, just serving, and all of that. You can imagine me changing house. I do one day, I looked at my neighbor. I said, man, I like their living room. I, like, I want to go and sleep there. Oh, I like this person. I want to go there. When would I have time for my own family to build my own family? And especially today where there's so much meetings everywhere, so much ministers are popping and there's nothing wrong. We're a body. But when it comes to you serving in your station, he said, if your eyes be single, your whole body will be full of light. And that's the problem. That the church is not filled with light that can light up the world. Why? Because we don't have single focused servants and leaders in the house. They like PO is the same way like they like PO and PI, they like another person. It's the same way they like another person, they like another person. You don't even know where you are. You don't even know what you are feeding on. You don't even know what you are listening to. What, what meal is building you up? Because it's everything that you listen to. Okay? So, look at the woman. Thank God for faith. The woman that Jesus met that was asking Jesus for, for healing. And Jesus said, no, I'm not going to give the bread of, 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 of the children to the dog. Even the dog, that woman insisted. But what was Jesus Christ to say? I'm not sent to you. I'm, not, I'm unapologetic about it. You're not my mission on the earth. You're not. <laughs> I can't be about everything. <laughs> so this understanding will help us. Okay. Let me skip if you let me skip a few things and just wrap it up here. And then just quickly touch on covenant a little bit. And finally, the prosperity of the church is also determined by our identity. One of the things that would distinguish the church in the end time is the prosperity of the church. But you see, I've come to understand and I've learned, and I'm still learning that when it comes to kingdom prosperity, it's also tied to knowing who you are. Knowing who you are. Because you see, when you know who you are in Christ, you know what you have. You see, redemption does not only reveal our inheritance to us, it also delivers. So it doesn't reveal, re redemption does not only reveal our heritage in Christ to us, it also delivers to us our inheritance in Christ. Because, listen, if you don't know what you have been given, then you are not going to be able to manifest what you have. That's what the, the, um, uh, um, Paul was talking about in Galatians, I think, 4. When he was talking about a son who is supposed to be the head to the master, but still behaves like a child, doesn't know. Then he's going to be like a slave. It's not different from a slave. So it means that he can't even exercise prosperity or live in the affluent life that he has been born into. Why? Because he doesn't know. It's like somebody, I heard the story of somebody who flew a first class for the first time, but because, you know what, he didn't know what the first class, you know what, uh, uh, um, flight, you know, um, uh, cabin offered him. He was just there looking when everybody was digesting. And then when they would offer him stuff, he would say no, because for him, he just felt like, no, I can't have too much because he's so used to economy. But he didn't realize that, you know what, first class, business class offers much more. So for an entire trip, that guy just deprived himself, but everything was available to him. Was available. But when you don't know who you are, you don't know what you have been given by Christ. The Bible says one of the grace, one of the grace that, that, that is supposed to be manifesting and we're supposed to be leveraging as Christians is the grace that made Jesus, who was rich, became poor so that you and I can be rich. And we don't talk about that grace. You have that unique grace in Christ when you know who you are. 
That that grace, the Bible says, because of that, because of grace, he who was rich became poor, so that you can be rich, I can be rich. So it's grace for riches. Study the scripture, you will see it there. So prosperity, our identity is what determines the knowledge of the identity. The revelation of this new creation life that we have is what will determine how prosperous we will be as a church. It's all based on identity. So it's greatly a function of identity, who you are in Christ. And because you need to understand why, that we are believers and we are not beggars. Because beggars will only want to take and take and take. But believers receive. That's why God has not called us to pay for anything. He's called us to receive it by believing. That's why David said, since I have been young, Psalm 37 verse 25, he says, since I have been young, now I'm old, I've never seen the righteous, you see, identity in Christ, righteous, beg for bread, not forsaking. Since I've been young, now I'm old, the righteous, I've never seen them beg. When you know who you are, you realize that you are not a beggar, you are a believer. You are a believer and you can, there's nothing that is impossible to him that believe. All your needs are met through faith. Everything that is available in Christ, the Bible says we receive it through faith. But you, sometimes we forget who we are now in Christ. So you don't even have the capacity of faith to say, you know what? Yes, I can have it. Yes, I will, I, I will receive it. Yes, I have it. I'm moving in this direction. I'm moving in this direction. Thank you, Jesus. Well, we are in Christ forbids poverty. Listen to this as I close. Your earning is not according to your degree or your pedigree, but according to your decree. As a believer, you have been given the authority of words. Authority of words to command the resources, to command the life, to command everything that you, it doesn't matter where you are, as long as you know who you are. And that's what Satan wanted to do to Jesus in the book of Luke chapter 4. He said, if you are the son of God, turn these stones into bread. Provision is based on identity. But Jesus, knowing who he was, didn't need to prove anything to Satan. But when the time came for Jesus to multiply just a little launch pack of a young boy, the launch, the launch of a young boy, he multiplied that there were 12 baskets left. Why? Because he knew. That's what the Bible says. He already knew what he would do. But look at what Satan, Satan also knew that provision was connected to identity. If you are the son of God, turn this stone into bread. So identity is connected to provision, prosperity. But Jesus said, no, not on this ground would I prove that I'm a son by providing for myself supernaturally. This is crucial, people of God. You can survive anywhere. Trust me. I'm not saying this because, because you know, oh, he's in America, he's, been, he's a British citizen. No, when I was in Nigeria, I started Grace House Publishing. I was, I was a dropout from two universities, six years in total, dropping out from Lautech and OU. It was in the place of revelation that Lord gave me the business idea. Within six months, we grew our clientele to 90 in the same place where I've been deprived and poor, such that I can't even, when I, sometimes when I was pastoring the campus, I would squeeze out 115 hours then to enter bus to, to Agawoye. I wouldn't even have to come back to Lagos after a week. And I was in a student, and I was pastoring on campus. But I would go because I know I can never be stranded in Agawi. When it's time for me to bring report back to Lagos, I will bring the report back. And it's the same way I've seen God move me into strange lands. You know what? But when I enter, that's why everywhere I go, PI will tell you this. My first declaration over the atmosphere or the climate of the of the location. Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. I Femi I have come in the name of the Lord. Therefore, everything I do in this place is blessed. I command the favor and the resources of the land. It's by your decree, not by your pedigree or your degree. Because as a child of God, You've been given the power and the authority of declaration and proclamation. Very crucial. So this is the reason why new creation reality teaching is very important. It's to help you understand who you are and not just understand it, walk in it. That's why we cannot be stopped as a church. We cannot be stopped. 
knowing who we are when we are a church is what is, is, is filled with leaders, members who understand this, who they now are. He said, all things have passed away, which means don't look at yourself as the defeated guy. That's one of the, what, what, that's one of the change that needed to happen to me. I needed to stop seeing myself as the guy who dropped out, as the guy who was on drugs, as the guy who was arrested and locked up in, in jail many times, or as the guy who was sleeping on the street. I needed to erase all of that. I needed to erase it. I needed to put that behind me. See, listen, many of you move away from treatment and start moving towards strategy for the future. Every time we talk to you, you are addressing things in the past, things in the past, things in the past, treatment, treatment. If all that you are getting is treatment, you are always going to be living in the past. Start moving towards strategy, embracing these new teachings, embracing the structure, the system, leadership, policy, culture, value of the church. That is strategy to move you from pain, you know what, to purpose, to move you from treatment to what, to strategy and prosperity. Because strategy is for the future. Treatment is addressing the past. It's addressing the past. It's addressing the past. An identity is born out of personality. Whose children are you? Whose child are you? You are the child of God. You are the child of God. You are the child of God. So this is very crucial. Let me bring you to a close here. This is very important, people of God. We are leaders. And when it comes to covenant reality, let me tell you one most important thing about covenant. Because creation talks about who you are. Covenant talks about how to live out who you are. And let me tell you something. It is relationship. The most important, I can tell you so much about covenant. And we might have another meeting sometime soon on that. But let me just say this. When it comes to covenant, the most important aspect of covenant is relationship. In a contract relationship, a relationship with your boss is not a must. If you have it, it's a plus, but it's not a must. Especially when you're working in a big organization, you may never even see the, the CEO because it's too far up the leadership chain within that church. Uh, sorry, within that organization or even a church, if it's big, my, mega church. But when it comes to covenant, the, it's a must and it's the most important aspect of the covenant your work with God in a contract relationship your work for your boss is critical the quality of your work the competence in which you carry out your work is very crucial but when it comes to Covenant, the quality of your work with God is non-negotiable. It's non-negotiable. It's not the agreement. You know, in a contract, you must sign the agreement for it to be valid, to, 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 of the, of the, of, for the contract to be valid. When it comes to covenant, you must work the covenant practices for the covenant to continue to produce in your life. Which means in a covenant relationship with God, hear this, the, the qualification for you to live out this Christian life is transferred to God. In other words, God is the one that is solely responsible once you fulfill the part, your part in the covenant, which is your quality walk with God adhering to covenant practices, God will fulfill his, his part of the covenant with you. So when he says, I make a covenant with you, I will do this. Yours is to walk the work of covenant and God will be responsible for the fulfillment of all that the covenant affords you and I in Christ Jesus. Go check it out. That's why I said, I'm a God that never breaks covenant. I keep my covenant. I keep my covenant. So this is the assurance of faith that you and I have. Because the just shall live by faith. When you discover who you are, then you walk by faith. Start working it out by faith. And what is the assurance of faith? It's that God is committed to the process. Committed to you. 
committed to everything that he has called you and promised you. And all that you have received of prophecy, God is committed. He's committed. Why? Because it's a covenant keeping God. So I pray for you in the name of Jesus because I want to bring this to a close. This is 1 hour 24 minutes now. But I know that we are family and I have more opportunities to, 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 to take you, you know, into important aspects of the covenant when the opportunity presents itself. But for now, let us bring this to a close because I know there are other amazing men and women of God that is also going to be sharing with you. And of course, your pastors are, I mean, they can do this by themselves easy easy but again the largeness of their heart and the spirit of collaboration is why we have been given this opportunity to share this moment with you but i just pray for you as a church and i pray for you as a team and i decree in the name of jesus christ that all that we have shared together becomes the lifestyle becomes the culture becomes the value system of this church in the mighty name of jesus I pray for your pastors right now and I decree the oil on their life, a renewal of that oil, freshness, daily freshness of that oil and that oil would, will run ceaselessly, overflowing on every one of you in the name of Jesus and I decree that you will be an army for the Lord in that nation and even beyond because the impact is going to go beyond. I'm hearing the Lord say that the impact and the people raised under these two leadership uh, will go beyond the four walls, the shores of Nigeria. But in years to come, many of you will say, I was part of Hope Center. And we would know you because you are doing something mighty. You are doing something greater. Many, I say, institutions were being birthed uh, by people in this, in this retreat. Members of this church. Members of this leadership that will become household names that will become a breath of fresh air in our nation and even beyond uh, in the name of Jesus. Books that are still going to be written, songs that are going to come out, uh, uh, initiatives that are going to be birthed. Uh, I just decree this in the name of Jesus uh, and I receive fresh favor in a new dimension over this house. The Bible says in the book of Acts of the Apostles that the early church were finding favor before the people and for that reason God was adding to the church Hope Center I decree a new order of favor begins to manifest in this church in your vicinity, in your environment in the city of Lagos and therefore increase in the name of Jesus, expansion in the name of Jesus Father I thank you, I give you the glory I pray for somebody here, listen this is a good place to be if you know I know this is not church, but listen, let me say this. And because, listen, I've been in Christ long enough to know we all have struggles. Please, if you know that you came to this camp meeting with a personal struggle, maybe struggles that you are not even confident to share, confident to share with your leaders or with people, do not leave this retreat ground without talking to God to help you about it. And even right now, I'm coming in agreement with you that all of you, Anyone here who have some struggles and this struggle has become an hindrance to how much you want to go all out for God. I just pray in the name of Jesus that in this camp meeting, the struggle, the power of God will break that stronghold in the name of Jesus. And you are walking free because the Bible says, if that the Lord set free, is free indeed. You are free from that struggle. You are free from that bondage. You are free from that chain. Right now, be broken in the name of Jesus Christ. Walk in the liberty of the Spirit. For the Bible says, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. So I see chains breaking in this camp meeting. Yes, I see chains breaking. I see chains breaking in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. I give you the glory and praise and I thank you for all that you are still yet to do in Jesus' mighty name. Amen, amen, amen. Well, I love you guys. P-I-P-O, thank you so much. God bless you guys. Enjoy the rest of your time at this retreat in Jesus' name. Amen. Love you, love you, love you loads.